Today I'm reviewing Joseph Garcia's video titled Only Experts Know These 10 Car Photography Shots. Expert, huh? Let's find out, shall we? I've shot for a lot of car brands like Lamborghini, Ferrari, Jaguar Land Rover, where every shoot is so different that I've never really thought about a definitive list, let alone a list of 10 shots. And also, in my previous YouTube video, I said that YouTube is the worst place to learn photography. Bold statement, I know, but let's see if that rings true in this video, which I hope, at the very least, gives you a different perspective from a working professional's point of view. And remember that there are two sides to every coin. Whichever side you prefer is entirely up to you. Let's dive in. Here are not only the 10 shots that every pro takes when they go on a shoot, but number 10 is gonna blow your mind because you're gonna realize how easy and simple car photography can really be. Okay, easy? It's easy to pick up a camera and press a button, but I usually like to put a bit of effort into my photography. So if I think a shot is easy, I'm probably not working hard enough, but that's just me. The straight shots. That just means that the tires are completely straight. You can shoot it from the side, you can shoot it forward, you can shoot it from the back, whatever you decide to do, but that's pretty straightforward. Um, straight wheels aren't really a shot. I'll get back to this in a second because his first two shots are connected, so I'll comment on them together the um, high shutter and light flicking. So this is actually an issue that I'm having right now. They're flickering way too much to the point where it's creating bands like all the way up and down my photo. All right, a lot to cover here so soon. The banding he mentioned, it's not banding. Do you know what it is? Pause the video and comment below if you do. And I'll give you a hint. He's pointing his camera directly at a bright light source. Banding is something else. It's usually what you see in a digital image when there's not enough color bit depth to show smooth transitions like when a light sky turns into a dark sky. But in his case, it's just good old lens flare. And there's really nothing you can do about it because the light source is literally in his shot. A lens with a better coating might reduce the flaring, but it won't get rid of it. Lower down that shutter speed as low as it goes until you see that it's not flickering as much. And then adjust your ISO, your aperture accordingly and just have really steady hands, basically. He also mentioned struggling to find the right balance of shutter speed to get a good handheld exposure without seeing the light flickering. That's one problem. But another problem is in his final shot where the camera isn't perfectly aligned to the center of the car. Both of these problems can be easily solved with a tripod. In low light, it's a no brainer and I don't know why he didn't use it. But to bring a tripod you most likely need it. In his case, he could have locked the camera down and bracketed a set of exposures to get a variety of aligned exposures. Then he can choose the best exposures for different parts of the car, like I did in this image for Audi. And for centering the camera on the car, again, a tripod makes sense because it's so much easier to fine tune the exact center line. I can typically spend about five to 10 minutes just making sure the camera is perfectly centered on the car. If it's slightly off, like here where there's a tire gap on the right side and no gap on the left, people will notice it as a mistake or lack of attention to detail. It's funny how the brain works. If the camera were a foot or two off center, people might somehow accept it as an intentional camera position. Use a tripod, people. I use it about 95% of the time. The second one is the turn. I know it sounds basic, but just please stick with me. It will make sense at the end. This goes right alongside with number one. This just means that the tire is turned. Okay, he's making a big deal out of this. While I agree that straight versus turn wheels should be considered, it's a minor thing I usually only think about when most of the important parts of the shot are already set up. Therefore, I don't agree that it should be included in this top 10 list. Camera position, lens choice, car angle, lighting, reflection management, all of these things are much more important than deciding whether the wheels are straight or turned. Having said this, straight wheels work practically with any car angle, so it's the safer choice. But the same can't be said for turned wheels, which don't work for a few car angles. Side profiles, for example, are always shot with straight wheels. I can't even find a reference to show you with turned wheels. The other two angles are the straight front and the straight rear, which are very technical shots because the car needs to look perfectly centered and level. Yes, rollers are included in here. So for those of you who don't know what a roller is, it's just when you're in a moving vehicle shooting at another car that is moving as well. Car to car rollers are, I guess, the cool way of shooting motion blurs and sometimes the only way. 
but it's often hit or miss situation to get a shot where the entire car is sharp. And you might have to compromise on what kind of lighting or background you'll get. Also, it's impossible to do motion blur when the car is turning. For example, this Porsche Taycan turning shot, I used a completely different method for shooting motion blurs. Comment down below if you want to see that video. If I was shooting in daylight, wanting to get a roller at a car going 40 miles an hour, here's what my settings would look like. Wide balance at 5600 Kelvin. ISO 100 or as low as it goes. And shutter speed, I'm going to start it at 1 over 40. And number four, my aperture will probably be at an f2.8, maybe f3.5. Depends how sunny it is outside. Okay, I think the settings look right here except for the aperture. I think f2.8 is too shallow depth of field to ensure the entire car is sharp. Besides, f2.8 with 1 over 40 shutter speed, at 100 ISO is going to way overexpose the image, even on a cloudy day. I recommend stopping down to at least F8 or even more to get the right car exposure and sharpness. However, number three is not just rollers, it is action shots. That means that the car is actually moving. I remember this one picture, I think it's by Aaron. All this sand is being thrown up. Oh my God, I'm pretty sure this was shot with the drone, but man, that is a good shot, dude. Yep, nice shot, I agree. Aaron is a good shooter. Now back to the car shoot before I got kicked out. Now the next one is the top down shot. Everybody be doing this, but it is a little bit more challenging because you have to carry a ladder with you or you have to have a drone or be in some place where you can actually shoot all the way down. That's why I always suggest if you can, go to like a parking garage where one of the parking garages overhangs another part of the parking garage so that you can move the car down under it and then you can shoot over it and you don't have to bring a ladder or anything like that. Okay, yep, I agree. Again, I would probably do the same. Parking garages are great for this, especially on the rooftop. But please get permission so you don't get kicked out. The last thing you want is to spend all that time and effort setting up everything, only to find out you get the boot. Getting kicked out filming a YouTube video isn't the end of the world, but if this happened during a client shoot, I can guarantee they'll never hire you again. It's super unprofessional. And by the way, I made a whole video about finding locations, so you can check this out. And the next one we have now is details. Every single pro photographer I've seen, they either shoot badges or really cool things about the interior or even rims or anything like that. I suggest shooting with a little bit tighter of a focal length, maybe more like a 50 millimeter and up if possible. Okay, details are important, but it really depends. If you're shooting a lot of shots, then there's room to squeeze in detail shots. For example, if you're doing a total of 20 shots, I would break that down to maybe eight full car exteriors, five exterior details or half shots, three wide interior shots, and four interior details. But if you're only shooting a handful of shots, that changes the ratios a bit. For this shot for Audi, I did one front three-quarter, one rear seven-eighth, one straight rear with a cool brake light animation, one exterior half car showing the charging port and wheel design, one interior dash and instrument cluster, and if you can only shoot one full interior shot, this is the angle. And finally, one interior detail. My typical focal lengths range from 25 millimeter to 50 millimeter for almost all my car photography. This narrow range makes the shots look and feel cohesive and belonging together. For detail shots, I would narrow that down to even more, 35 millimeter to 50 millimeter. I almost never go over 50 millimeter for any car work. The movie trailer shot. Anytime you see posters where they leave a lot of headroom, this is what we're talking about. There is something critical that you need to know about doing this type of shot. There is a huge difference between an intentional crop with headroom and an unintentional crop where you're just forcing the text in there. Uh, shooting posters is probably a thing. I'm just not sure if it qualifies for this top 10 list. An actual movie poster will typically be shot by a photographer working in the entertainment industry, not the car industry. Like Jeff Lipsky, whom I interviewed recently in this video you can see here. What I think he means is that sometimes you have to shoot with the intention of leaving space for graphics and text that will be added later. And that is certainly something that happens quite often. I get graphics and text from clients ahead of a shoot so I can overlay them in Capture One as I'm shooting. And this lets me frame the shot properly removing any guesswork about where the graphics will be. It's a great feature in Capture One that doesn't embed the graphics into the image, but rather acts as a guide to help you frame accurately. So the next one is what I like to call the car chop. Typically, you're gonna show the car in its context, and this will be like on a carousel, or it's gonna be like multiple photos put together. So that means that once they see it, they're gonna be like, whoa, that's just like a cool abstract piece that adds to your picture, and it's not just, you know, a full shot of the car. 
Yep, I agree with this. I won't show a single photo of a detail on its own, but rather accompanied by full car shots as a complete set of images. Otherwise, showing only details will be too abstract and won't present the full context of the car. The lineup shot. Create not just leading lines, but also shapes that can guide your eye through the image. Make a decision on whether you're focusing on just one car in the group or you're focusing on all the cars in the group. Shots of cars all lined up at a slight angle looks very good. But this is the time to ask you, am I focused on the first car, a car in the middle, a car in the back, or all of them? Okay, the industry term we use for multiple car shots is the group shot, which basically means two or more cars in a shot. The lineup he mentioned, where cars are positioned in a straight line, falls under the group shot title. Another type is the staggered shot, where the cars are all pointing in different directions. Staggered shots are actually generally preferred by clients because you can see more of each car at different angles. Like in this case, I shot for Lexus a few years ago for the EX and RX launches. And group shots happen less often than single car shots, primarily because it takes the client a lot of work to arrange and prepare multiple cars. However, this varies from job to job. Is the landscape shot. So basically, you just want to go to a great location. Yes, the subject is part of the photo, but it's pretty much everything as a whole. So you give the audience the opportunity to double dip where they can get a good location, get a good landscape. A lot of people do it with like 7-Elevens, gas stations, uh, mountains. They do it with leading lines. I hate to say this, but his terminology is off again. He's referring to the environmental shot. Images where the car and its surroundings are equally important showing the relationship between the car and the environment it's in. Just Google environmental portraits for a good explanation. And although landscape is also a photography term, I'm thinking distant mountains and vast oceans, which of course isn't what we're talking about here. I have to say that environmental shots, apart from shooting in a studio, are pretty much what most commercial car photography is nowadays. Just remember that the foreground and background can easily take up more space than the car itself in the image up to 80% environment, 20% car in some cases. So it's really important to consider the entire image. This is one mistake I see a lot of photographers make. They only prioritize the car without equal consideration for everything else in the shot. Here is where everything comes together. You mix them all together. See this shot? You have a landscape as well as a straight shot. How about this one? It's a trailer shot and a landscape shot. See the text on the top as well as being able to see all of the hills and the mountains in the back? Or how about this trifecta here? You got a straight shot along with an app. No. No, no, no. I'm skipping this one because it's going to take me too long to explain why. And that's it. What do you guys think about this reaction? Was I too picky or critical? Or perhaps not enough? Regardless, I hope you enjoyed it, found some value, and I would appreciate some of your suggestions for me to react to. Hit like and subscribe if you don't mind, or consider contacting me for one-on-one -on -one consultations to raise your photography level via my email in the description below. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon. Oh, you're still here? What do you want? Okay, I have something for you. I'm a new affiliate of Audio. If you click my link in the description below and use the code SAVE70, you'll get a whopping 70% off the annual pro account. I'll do the math for you. That's 59 US dollars compared to the regular 199. Their link match AI feature can suggest songs based on your references, and it allowed me to find a song literally in two minutes. So much faster than scrolling endlessly in other music libraries. Really worth checking out. Okay, I'm done.